Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. We're continuing our study of the Gospel of Matthew and we're looking at chapter 11. Here's the outline of our study. We've already discussed the coming of the king. Now we're in this section entitled Proclaiming the Kingdom. We'll be there till the middle of chapter 16. That will be followed by Facing Rejection, Enduring the Cross, and Conquering Death, the last chapter of Matthew. Under the heading of Proclaiming the Kingdom, we've talked about the beginning of the Galilean ministry, the Sermon on the Mount, Miracles of Healing, and now we're in a section entitled Sending Forth the Twelve. As we continue this section, Sending Forth the Twelve, that we began in the end of chapter 9, we moved through chapter 10 and now into chapter 11. As you see in the highlighted part of our screen, we're going to talk about six accents in the voice of Jesus. And as we read this passage in just a moment, let's listen for the accent of confidence, the accent of of admiration, the accent of sorrowful rebuke, the accent of heartbroken condemnation, the accent of authority, and the accent of compassion. These are headings that I found in Barclay's um, commentary on Matthew, volume 2. Before we go any further, let's read chapter 11. I'm reading, as usual, from the ESV. When Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. For the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. Then the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, he's a glutton a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. 
Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. As Jesus speaks to different people about different things, we hear the accent of his voice vary and change. First, let's talk about the accent of confidence, which we heard in the first six verses. John had spoken so fiercely and so definitely that he put his own life in danger. Herod Antipas had put away his own wife and married his sister-in-law, his sister-in-law. John rebuked him for it and Herod took his revenge. John was thrown into a dungeon. Can you imagine how that would affect John? Perhaps in this confinement, John began to question what he thought he knew as a certainty. What are the possibilities behind his question, are you he that is to come, or shall we look for another? Perhaps he asked this question for his disciples' sake. When people begin to question Christ's supremacy, what is our best option? Intellectual debate or sharing the experience of his changing power through the word? Perhaps John was getting impatient. From Matthew 3, 7 through 12, we see how his message was one filled with doom for those who refused to repent. When was the axe going to swing? John perhaps was wanting this to happen soon. However, looking to Jesus for savage wrath will leave a man disappointed. But if we look to Jesus for love, then we'll find all of our hopes fulfilled. Perhaps it was a question of the dawning of faith and hope. Perhaps as he sat in his cell, he thought more and more about Jesus and his mission. He believed Jesus was the one to come, and with this question, he looked for his hope and faith to be confirmed. It's in Jesus' answer that we hear the accent of confidence. He told John's disciples to relay his actions. Tell John what's happening. Only Jesus can be unequivocally judged by his deeds. And he still tells us, look what I can do for you and see what I can, I've done for others. Jesus still wields the power to open the eyes of the spiritually deaf, the spiritually dumb, and the spiritually blind. Who is the blessed one? Well, he who does not take offense at Jesus. Some are offended by Jesus because he does not meet their idea of their ideal of religion. Let me share something from Chumley's commentary. The humble worshiper has abundant reason through Scripture to believe in God. If then he runs into some difficulty, even a difficulty as great as the problem of evil, he does not, for that reason, give up his faith. The reasons for his faith are so great that they can weather a few storms. Chumbly quoted this from Elton Trueblood, his book The Philosophy of Religion, page 244. In verses 7 through 11, we hear Jesus talk with the accent of admiration. Have we ever heard of Jesus speaking of any other mortal man with this much admiration as he had for John the Baptist? Did they go to seek a reed shaken by the wind? Did they consider John to be as ordinary as a reed shaken by the wind on the banks of the Jordan River? Did they think he would be a weak-kneed vacillator? someone who could not stand his ground? Did they go out into the wilderness to see a man dressed to the nines, as we like to say? We know Herod's courtiers dressed in this fashion, but John was not an ambassador for Herod. He was an ambassador for God. Did they go out to see a prophet? You might want to pause and read Amos 3, 7. 
the true prophet of God had to possess God's message and have the courage to present it. This was John the Baptist all day long. Was John more than a prophet? According to Jesus, he was the new Elijah. See Malachi 4.5. The new Elijah of Jewish prophecy. John was the herald of the Messiah. In these verses, Jesus speaks of John with the accent of admiration. Jesus says the least in the kingdom is greater than John. Even non-Christian thinkers will admit that the coming of Jesus changed things that have never been changed back. What did John lack that Christians possess? That would be a view of the cross. John knew the holiness and justice of God, but he did not live to see the love of God in all of its fullness. Could John's message be considered the good news? Well, only in Christ and his death on the cross do we tr truly hear the good news that we call the gospel of Christ. Jesus wants to know which is better, to be the bride of Christ or the best man of Christ. Remember, the Bible teaches us that the church is the bride of Christ. How does John compare to Moses? How does he compare to all of the Old Testament prophets? God has always used men as his signposts and streetlights to lead the way toward places that individually a man could never go. Jesus pauses for a few moments and talks about violence in the kingdom in verses 12 through 15. I want to read Luke 16, 16, which we'll do that real quick. In Luke 16, 16, Jesus says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom is, of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. This is the way Luke says, quotes what Matthew quotes here in verses 12 through 15. Luke connects the violence in the kingdom differently than Matthew. Perhaps Luke meant that the kingdom would be gained by the desperate. And by the desperate, I mean those who will make a great effort to enter into it. Meanwhile, though, uh, Matthew seems to say that the kingdom had and would continue to suffer violence and persecution at the hands of violent men. This is the typical interpretation of, the, of this passage. But I won't want to posit this. Perhaps it is both a warning of violence and a challenge to the good-hearted to overcome that violence and enter the kingdom and then fight to remain there. We know that the law did speak with prophecy, passages such as Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 18, as did the prophets. Jesus reiterates that one must be willing to accept the fact that John is the forerunner they had waited so long to hear from. God sends his messenger, and some will refuse to recognize him, much less heed the messenger. God's truth and his revelation are powerful with or without man's response. Now back to the accents. In verses 16 through 19, we hear Jesus speak with the accent of sorrowful rebuke. Jesus is saddened by the sheer perversity of human nature. People, people are contrary, as my grandma would always say, always bristling at suggestions and often going off in the opposite direction. Meanwhile, John was a man of the wilds. He fasted, he dressed poorly, he shunned the crowds, and he lived in the desert. People said he was mad. Jesus, on the other hand, mixed with people, feasted when he could, and shared in their joy. People said he was a partier and a socialite. 
When someone does not want to hear the truth, it's easy to find excuses to reject it. Adults can often seem like spoiled children who refuse to play no matter what game is offered. Wisdom will be borne out by its deeds. The Jew might criticize John or Jesus for their lifestyle, but their deeds will prove them true. In verses 20 through 24, we hear Jesus speak with the accent of heartbroken condemnation. What do we really know of Jesus' work in Chorazin and Bethsaida? Well, virtually nothing, but he must have preached and performed many works among them. See John 21, 25. And then recall, of course, Capernaum was his adopted hometown. The phrase, woe to you, comes from a Greek word meaning anger caused by sorrowful pity. Jesus felt this towards these people because he had offered them the thing most precious and they disregarded it out of hand. His anger did not come from bruised pride, but from a broken heart. If Jesus compares their sins to Tyre and Sidon, and you might want to go read Isaiah chapter 23, Jeremiah 25, 22, 47, 4, passages in Ezekiel such as 26, 3 through 7, and 28, 12 through 22, If he compares Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah, then the sins of Tyre and Sidon must be terrible. Let's talk about the sin. It was a sin of people who ignored the responsibility that comes with privilege. The Messiah never preached directly to any of the OT cities, yet Galilee had seen much of his earthly ministry. It was a sin of indifference. These cities did not run Jesus out of town or seek to crucify him. They simply disregarded him. And that, of course, is a sin we see deeply in our world today. So, if it was a sin of people ignoring the responsibility that comes with privilege and a sin of doing nothing, a sin of indifference, it was then a sin of doing nothing. There are sins of commission, but there are sins just as terrible of omission. The I never did anything defense will fail on the judgment day. Even cities notorious for doing evil will be better off in the judgment day than the cities that failed to respond to Jesus, quoting Leon Morris from his commentary on Matthew. If Gentile cities that all the Jews believe were justly condemned for their unbelief, if those cities were better off than these Jewish towns, how bad off were these Jewish towns? They were indeed going to receive judgment. In verses 25 through 27, we hear Jesus now speaking with the accent of authority. Jesus had experienced rejection from the rabbis, from the scribes and the lawyers, while the simple people accepted him. Is Jesus condemning intellectual power? Nope, intellectual power is not the problem. Intellectual pride is the problem. We know that in the Jewish religion, the rabbis themselves taught against intellectual pride. Let me read something from Barclay's commentary concerning this intellectual pride. It's, it's a fairly lengthy reading, but be patient. The rabbis themselves saw the danger of this intellectual pride. They recognized that often simple people were nearer God than the wisest rabbi. They had a parable that went like this. Once a rabbi was in the marketplace, and Elijah appeared to him. The rabbi asked, Is there among the people in this marketplace anyone who is destined to share life in the world to come? At first, Elijah said there was none. 
Then he pointed out one man and said that that man would share in the life of the world to come. And the rabbi went to the man and asked him what he did. He says, I'm a jailer, said the man, and I keep men and women separate. At night, I place my bed between the men and the women so that no wrong will be committed. Elijah pointed at two other men, said that they too would share a life to come. And the rabbi asked them what they did. We're merrymakers, they said. When we see a man who is downcast, we cheer him up. Also, when we see two people quarreling with one another, we try to make peace between them. The men who did the simple things, the jailer who kept his charges in the right way, and the men who brought a smile and brought peace, these were men, according to the rabbis, who would inherit the kingdom of God. Perhaps in this passage, verses 25 and 27, we have the greatest claim Jesus ever made. He claimed to be the Son of God. He didn't claim to be a Son of God. We're all sons of God. He claimed to be the Son of God. Take a moment and go read John 14, 9. By looking at Jesus, we can see what God is like. Only by being humble and trustful enough to receive his teachings can one be a true Christian. In verses 28 through 30, we'll see Jesus speaking with the accent of compassion. The true seekers of God were being driven to despair. Jesus invites these weary ones to come to him. Our intellectual search for God will fail if we do not direct our search towards Christ. The old law and the Jews' interpretation of the old law were their spiritual burdens. See Matthew 23, 4. Theirs was a religion of thou shalt not. Meanwhile, Jesus invites his followers to take up his yoke. His yoke is well-fitting. He says it's an easy yoke. The tailor made yokes to fit their specific uh, animal. Whatever God sends us is made to fit our needs and abilities exactly. So his yoke is easy. It's tailor-made to fit. But what makes the yoke of Christ light? The yoke of Christ is made light by the Heavenly Father and Christ and their love. A burden given in love and carried in love is always light. His followers are invited to learn of me. It's a learning process that will be profoundly affecting how a person believes and behaves. In his commentary, Kenneth Chumley said, If your life as a Christian seems heavy, you're carrying a burden that belongs to someone else. It's certainly not the yoke of the Lord. I hope that you enjoyed looking at these six accents that Jesus spoke with here in chapter 11. Matthew did a wonderful job of gathering together these ideas and putting them in chapter 11. Next time, we will begin our study of Matthew 12. I sure appreciate you watching these videos, and I would really appreciate it if you would take time to like this video, subscribe to this channel, Ring the notification bell next to the subscribe button and leave me a comment. Until the next time we meet, may the good Lord bless you and keep you.